Thank you, Eva. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, but before I say anything else, I, I also want to thank all of you for your generosity and, and for partnering with United Way on this really important work that we're going to talk about today. Um, this work uh, and, and its impact wouldn't be possible without your support. So, so really, thank you very much. Um, we're excited to be here to learn and discuss and celebrate the impact uh, that's been made by your investments, uh, specifically through the Twin Cities Rebuild for the Future Fund. Um, last summer, after the murder of George Floyd, um, there was outrage and civil unrest, and it resulted in significant property damage in cultural corridors where Black, Brown, and Indigenous people work and own businesses. Um, to support the rebuilding efforts of these BIPOC-owned small businesses, United Way partnered with the St. Paul, uh, St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation and also the Minneapolis Foundation to establish the Twin Cities uh, Rebuild for the Future Fund. Uh, together, we raised really an unbelievable amount. We raised more than $3.2 million, uh, which was distributed to 11 community organizations uh, working with businesses on the front lines to support the rebuilding efforts. Um, the fund prioritized support in really the three hardest hit districts, the West Broadway Corridor in Minneapolis, uh, Lake Street in Minneapolis, and University Avenue in St. Paul. Uh, the support wasn't limited to these three areas, but, but that's certainly the areas that were prioritized. Uh, these funds were used to cover repairs, uh, equipment, technology, building materials, relocation expenses, and more in support of these small businesses. And, and you're going to get an opportunity to hear more about the impact made by these funds from our speakers today. Uh, Greater Twin Cities United Way is also, also partnering uh, with the Minneapolis Foundation and the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation on much needed criminal justice reform. Uh, the criminal justice system is broken. Uh, the policies are often rooted in long-standing racism and oppression, uh, and that's caused deep, predictable, and frankly, unacceptable disparities for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. To transform the criminal justice system, we will learn from support and we'll partner on solutions with people who are directly impacted by racism in the justice system. Uh, Community-based organizations and policy decision makers will lead and execute the justice reform work. And then our three organizations, us and the two foundations, will learn from and support the community and fund solutions. Uh, Huda Ahmed, uh, Huda is a transformational change expert, a community activist, and a Humphrey Policy Fellow alum will lead this work. Uh, she'll support the collaboration and also help co-create solutions in partnership with the broader community. Uh, this work has started, it's in its early stages, but we know that driving systemic change uh, takes significant time. So this is a long-term multi-year effort. Uh, we'll keep you updated on our progress and our work and feel free to reach out to your United Way relationship officer if you want to check in or learn more. But before I hand it off to our next speaker, I, I just want to again thank you for supporting our community and investing in this important work. When we unite as change makers, we can disrupt these systems and address the challenges that really nobody can address alone. So together, uh, we'll work together to create a community where all people thrive, regardless of their income, their race, or their place. And so now I'd like to turn it back over to our first speaker, Ava Margolis. Ava is a program officer at Greater Twin Cities United Way. Ava? Thank you so much, John. Uh, now I'd like to introduce you to our community partners who have been working tirelessly to support businesses who were affected by George Floyd's killing by Minneapolis police in the ensuing days of civil unrest that led many businesses damaged or completely destroyed. These 11 intermediary organizations have been responsible for the regranting of your dollars to businesses 
and they have been providing essential technical assistance. These community partners were selected to lead this work because of their infrastructure and ability to deploy financial supports and resources to businesses, and because of their strong relationships with and expertise supporting Black, African, Asian, Native, and Latino entrepreneurs. Next slide, please. There are also four chambers who have been providing outreach to local business communities. They have been disseminating information in multiple languages and have been helping to direct businesses <clears throat> to related grant making organizations. When we first started developing a strategy for the Twin Cities We Build for the Future Fund, it was our ethnic chambers that we listened to as they spoke about their members' needs. These conversations were back in June, just days following George Floyd's killing and as the smoke was still settling from the civil unrest. Business owners and community members shared not only about the financial impact, but also the emotional, psychological, and social. In thinking about this time, I'd like to share a quote that one of our partners, Neighborhood Development Center, recently shared in their reporting. Um, so just the, the quote from uh, Neighborhood Development Center, uh, many business owners experience complex and traumatic racialized stress. NDC staff and our community of supporters especially those who are Black, experience similar stress. Our feelings of outrage and grief in reaction to the killing of George Floyd and so many others, the continued anti-Black racism, police brutality, and systemic racism, mingled with our feelings of shock and sadness at the loss of and damage to neighborhood businesses. It was like nothing we'd experienced in our 27-year history of working alongside entrepreneurs. At NDC, we channeled our grief into action in the immediate aftermath when we helped boarded up buildings and hit the streets to offer help. Next slide, please. The Rebuild Fund intentionally supported and was responsive to technical assistance needs and related capacity building. The chief, the, this chart reflects a breakdown with preliminary numbers of the kinds of support that partners are providing businesses. Um, please note that we're still assessing data, which is based upon grantee reports that are actually still coming in. Um, so please keep in mind that the data here really is an exclusive sneak, uh, sneak peek for you all today. Um, this chart reflects the frequency by which organizations are providing a specific service. And I'd like to highlight just a few. The most common assistance relates to business development, <clears throat> excuse me, and planning, including financial management and documentation, contingency planning, and business development training. Organizations are helping business owners to identify and apply for public and private loans, and equally so. They've been helping to identify grants, as well as support businesses through, these, through the application processes. It's important to note that many of the small or micro businesses affected are unable to take on debt, even if they're eligible for loans. And that's why your gifts have been so essential. The Northside Economic Opportunity Network spoke to this um, and it's being interrelated with the technical assistance. And I quote, our food businesses suffered too as caterers lost contracts and pop-up events were canceled. These already marginalized businesses were not in a position to take on the debt provided by loan-based relief programs. They're, they needed an influx of cash to survive this crisis. In 2020, we set ambitious goals of serving 700 entrepreneurs through direct service in addition to providing 3,000 hours of one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. However, demand was double that. In 2020, due to COVID and the civil unrest, they served over 1,300 clients and more than doubled TA at nearly uh, 6,800 hours. And other community partners also have been stretching to meet the, um, the needs of small businesses in a similar way. Next slide, please. Intermediary community partners are also supporting each other as they're raising the collective power of their voices through existing collaborations as well as new ones. 73% are working with other organizations to, to support direct financial assistance. 64% are supporting the capacity of other organizations through technical assistance. 45% are working uh, with some kind of collaboration to increase owned real estate of businesses of color. We ask community partners to share their recommendations on how Greater Cities United Way and other funders might support ongoing efforts towards racial equity systems change as it pertains to small businesses of color and safeguarding cultural business corridors from displacement and gentrification. A common theme is the need for continued grant making to businesses and technical support. 
Black Women's Wealth Alliance offers some specific calling out to, and I quote, support um, efforts to acquire vacant and other commercial properties for sale. This is critical, a critical need that requires large sums of money placed into funds led by various agencies, including BIPOC community development corporations, of which several are emerging, and funding pre-development efforts to support entrepreneurs' efforts to engage the planning and legal processes of acquiring commercial real estate. And we'll get to hear some more examples of the partnerships uh, shortly in our panel discussion. Next slide, please. The St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation provided additional support through their community sharing fund. This money went out to help individual business owners and their employees make ends meet during the emergency and supported their loss of income due to the unrest. A total of $194,000 in community sharing fund grants went out and based on preliminary reports, more than 80 individuals have received these emergency grants with an average grant size of uh, just over $1,200. The most common uses have been to pay for rent and mortgage, as well as utilities and groceries. Next slide, please. The Rebuild Fund has been supporting not only businesses that continue to be affected by the civil unrest, which are being compounded by COVID-19, but has also supported early recovery of the devastation to the ecosystems in which the businesses exist. This chart provides a breakdown of the types of businesses who have received rebuild funds. Over 1.8 million have already been granted to date. And please keep in mind that these are, are very much preliminary numbers as we're still um, getting more data in. Um, so again, this really is a, an exclusive preview uh, to, to the numbers, but I'd like to raise up a few points about the data. The data thus far indicates that about 30%, 37% of businesses receiving grants are food related. Broken down further, 65% of these food businesses are restaurants, cafes, or caterers, and 35% grocery stores. The implications here for food, for food systems are huge, especially when we consider that many businesses operate, <clears throat> excuse me, operate in communities where there's food apartheid. Here, we might look to the learnings and recommendations raised up in Greater Twin Cities United Way's innovation initiatives relating to food systems in North Minneapolis and the previous investment of full lives. 15% of businesses are providing services related to healthcare. This includes clinics, healthcare supply businesses, and multiple businesses providing culturally specific care for, for elders. Asian Economic Development Association regranted to one here healthcare business, a clinic on University Avenue. The owner, Dr. Pafo Yang, was interviewed by NPR in mid-August. She said that her nephew was amongst peaceful Black Lives Matter protesters during the civil unrest, and it was he who alerted her that the lights were on inside her clinic at 10 p.m. when the looters had taken over. She told him not to intervene. Dr. Yang calculated uh, $150,000 in damages, including stolen equipment. Again, here, uh, the money uh, for, for the granting was absolutely essential. It's also important to note that one of the community, another community partner, American Indian Community Development Corporation, not only were granted to native owned businesses along Frank, Franklin Avenue in South Minneapolis, but they also supported the work of organizations who organized volunteer security during the civil unrest along the Franklin Avenue corridor. And their intervention stopped some of the damages, um, stopped some of the damage to buildings along Franklin Avenue. Uh, next, we're excited to share this video that was created by two-time Emmy-nominated producer, Georgia Fort. And this video was made for one of the organizations that were the recipients of your funding towards the Rebuild Fund and a strong partner of ours, the Northside Funders Group. With the uh, civil unrest and the, the COVID, if we didn't get those funding, it was going to be really tough to keep the door open. I couldn't imagine you know, like this round of COVID that we're going through now and there being nothing available for businesses to be able to do the work that they need to do. It's just the reality was we were sitting there like, we're screwed. It was very scary for everybody and there was a lot of gray area. Nobody knew what was next, nobody knew what was now. We were just kind of like moving however we could move. And so there was a slowdown to pretty much all businesses. Getting funding uh, from West Broadway through the Northside Funders Group, it definitely helped 
you know, pay bills. Do those repairs and then pay the light bill, the gas, and pay some of the rent, but also help grow to the next level, actually. Um, that helps. I wasn't at that level to where I was even looking for anything like that. Now, oh, I am, <laughs> I definitely am. So I'm thankful for the relationships and the organizations that are helping us. You know, that's gonna go a long way. I don't think people appreciate how much that community sense really is um, a part of North Minneapolis and Broadway. Because everybody's really close. We look out after each other, the organizations and the businesses. It's my pleasure and honor to uh, introduce uh, our next uh, part of our uh, event today, uh, which should be a presentation by Renee Dasman of the Neighborhood Development Center. Renee uh, uh, oversees all functions of the organization um, as the president. Her background includes leading teams in merchandising, product development, uh, and design for Target. She also served as vice president of bakery and vice president of category development for Southeastern Grocers. Renee and her husband are also the founders of Affirmation House, a not-for-profit for homeless men that provides housing and services to eliminate homelessness. In addition, Renee is a certified professional and executive life coach and has been a business owner herself. Welcome, Renee. Oh, thank you so much, Eva, and thank you for that beautiful video. I definitely want to start out with just saying um, we're creating a culture of gratitude in NDC, and I just can't tell you how grateful we are for all of you and um, just the opportunity to share our story and, and what we do. So I'll get right to it. I want to say um, hello to the NDC team that's joined. This is just me speaking to the great work that you do every day. I appreciate and love you all. NDC was started 27 years ago by a man named Mike Tamale, who some of you may know. And um, with, with the help of Bill Sands in the Western Bank Building in St. Paul, been around for 27 years doing this work, we believe that concentrated poverty needs concentrated opportunity. And um, I'll walk you through the four pillars that we use to do the work that we do. The first one being, um, let me just set the background. NDC focuses primarily on eight of the lowest um, income areas in the Twin Cities. We've just recently added Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center. Over 80% of those that the entrepreneurs that we support are people of color and 80 per, over 80% are also the low to lowest income. So what we've done is we do a training. So you, we have a 12 week training program. As a result of everything that happened, we went online with the training program. I will say to you that we have an opportunity to do um, to provide different trainings and to provide more technology for our entrepreneurs because a lot of them are using their phones to try to do the training. But so far we've done about 6,000. We supported about 6,000 entrepreneurs during our time. You then move on to, you have this training, you come out of the training with the business plan, which is wonderful to start your business. You then move into, you need some money to start your business. Now, what am I gonna do now? I need money. So we are a CDFI, a community, um, financial de development um, institution and that means that we do character character based lending so it's not about your credit score it's not about your equity for the bankers that are on the call if there are any of you out there our default rates around three percent so i want to paint another story for you over the years ndc has been about 25 million dollars in loans in this past year after um, the COVID um, and then the, the uprising, we've done seven and a half million dollars in loans and grants. That's from PPP, state, government, city, county, any money that we could get because we knew that access to capital and getting the money on the street fast was necessary. And that's another thing that I wanna thank you for giving us this grant and getting it to us so quickly without all the red tape was such a blessing. I can't, I can't express that enough. So you got your training, 
you got your money. Now you need some additional technical assistance to get your business going. We provide that. We do pro bono work with the assistance of legal assistance from Fredrickson and Byron. Get your POS system set up, anything you need. We've done 77,000 hours of, that, of technical assistance. And then you move to incubators. And that's where this lovely picture of Vicki and Manny Gonzalez from Manny's Tortas is. One of our largest incubators is the Midtown Global Market located just eight blocks from where George Floyd was murdered. We also have a new incubator space that's under development right as we speak on the corner of University and Dale in St. Paul, where we will have our new training center and incubator space, as well as our Frogtown Square incubator and our um, our um, Frogtown, um, our, another Frogtown incubator in that space. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. So then I'll just go through quickly. These are a couple of the businesses that you've helped. Um, Bole Ethiopian restaurant, as you can see, was completely destroyed as a result of everything that happened. We, I remember you guys, I remember sitting on a call with Solomon, the owner, and just like, what are we going to do? And how are we going to be able to help you to be able to rebuild. They did a GoFundMe. Um, we used your funds to help support them so that they can now start working on getting a new location. Banadir Pharmacy, the same thing. His name is Idris. He lives, it's, his business was in South Minneapolis. Your money helped him to get his inventory back in stock because you know the, the insurance claims were moving slow and some people were completely underinsured to be quite honest with you. And then the bottom picture is a picture of Century, Century Plaza, which is, um, uh, entrepreneur called Gloria Wong. And it's actually a great space that has other entrepreneurs inside of it, um, primarily Hmong entrepreneurs. And so we helped her because she couldn't, um, the insurance claims didn't come in fast enough for her to get her windows up and running or uh, fixed um, after they had been broken. So those were just a few. And then on the next slide, I want to highlight um, the key story of the of the, the evening, which is um, Midtown Eye Care Clinic. They were literally across the street on Lake in Chicago from the Midtown Global Market. And as you can see on um, the pictures on the right, they were completely destroyed. The, the building was deemed unsafe and had to be demolished. This eye care clinic is vital to the community. Um, this The owner is Ahmed Muhammad and they, um, him and his partner, Ahmed Segal, have been, they're from Somalia, have been in the US for 20 years. Ahmed has actually held various positions in state and local government. And so then we can go to the next slide. As a, this is their new location located right inside the global market. We felt like, you know, we had some spaces opening up in the market as a result of everything. And we really wanted to make sure that we partnered with a community minded organization, service organization, and somebody whose property had been destroyed. And this is now the new site of the Midtown Eye Care Clinic. And we are so happy to have them inside the market. Next slide. And the market, by the way, is co-owned with the Cultural Wellness Center. I want to make sure that I um, properly acknowledge them. So I started with thank you. I'm going to end with thank you. I, I can't express enough. Um, I talked a little bit about how quick you guys were, um, how you removed the barriers to us, to us moving forward. And I want to share just a quick story. The money that you allocated for us to focus on personal or financial hardship was was brilliant. And we actually, during our outreach, we talked about being boots on the ground, getting out, talking to entrepreneurs, finding out what they needed so that we weren't just making things up. We found out one of our entrepreneurs was homeless as a result of everything that happened. And we were actually able to use your money to help them um, um, get back on their feet. So I can't thank you enough for this. And as a result, what we're looking at is not only obviously to help them survive this time, but also to help them thrive. And so we're looking at future focused things. We're looking at different ways that we can drive revenue for these entrepreneurs. Um, we're looking at mental health um, opportunities and a, a new program that we're spearheading to help our entrepreneurs with their mental health because that's so important during this time. And the last thing I wanna leave you with that you're helping us create because we're saving some of your money and putting it aside from it is we're creating a beauty corner within the global market that it will have businesses that were displaced as a result of the unrest. So we got a beauty supply, a beauty store, uh, a hair salon, a barber shop, a nail place that we wanna place inside the market thanks to your help. 
could not thank you enough, Twin Cities United Way, Minneapolis Foundation, St. Paul, Minnesota Foundation, and all the, do the donors that supported this rebuilding for the Future Fund. Thank you so much. And I know I went over. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Thank you so much, Renee and NDC, for the tremendous work you do. Next, it's my honor to introduce Henry Jimenez, Executive Director and President of Latino Economic Development Center. He has dedicated his academic and professional life to advocating for and advancing his community. Prior to taking over the leadership of LEDC in 2019, Henry ran a variety of programs and organizations with local to statewide scopes. Henry's focus with LEDC is to help Latino entrepreneurs start or expand their businesses. He considers his work an honor and a privilege because of the opportunity it gives him not only to support the Latino community itself, but also recognize and amplify its important place in Minnesota's economy. Henry also serves as the founding president of the Board of Directors of COBOL, a nonprofit working to consolidate and activate the civic power of Minnesota's Latinos. Welcome, Henry. Thank you, Eva, and thank you all. Um, again, my name is Henry Jimenez, the Executive Director of the Latino Economic Development Center. And I, just like Renee started, I, I actually want to give you a round of applause, Renee. I know that it's so weird to do this remotely, but uh, I work with NDC as well. Um, LEDC was started in 2003 uh, by entrepreneurs that were um, really working out of uh, Mercado Central. Um, and so I want to thank them, but I also want to take a moment to also thank NDC. NDC had a, a lot to do with uh, the beginning of our of our uh, of our organization and um, during these times uh, Renee and Mike Tamale have have been nothing but great uh, mentors and, and and support to me um, but also to LEDC so I just want to make sure folks also know the collaboration that's happening between us as well um, as you can see with this slide I, I want to make sure that you all know I get to talk about what our organization is doing but these are the folks and I, I want to start every presentation this year with with the folks that that do the work uh, th this is our staff uh, this is taken I think probably two days before you know uh, everything just shut down in March um, the team has changed dramatically um, to from from about 12 to 16 full-time staff and um, 35 contractors and I'll explain why it's so many um, and and the connection of how your support got us to having that many contractors Next slide. Um, the, the strategy for LEDC uh, with the support, again, from the Greater Twin Cities United Way, uh, Minneapolis Foundation and St. Paul was, if we're receiving these funds, what, what would be the best thing that we can do with these? And, and for, for us at the time was obviously to support our Latino businesses and other immigrant entrepreneurs access even more resources. Because I know, as we were talking to, to folks, um, everybody wanted to support and, and, and provide us with funding that we can give to our entrepreneurs or re-grant that to them. But it, it, I think we all can agree that um, the, the need is it's immense. And so I felt that our team needed to utilize these funds to uh, provide a, a quick assistance to the entrepreneurs, but also at the same time, ensuring that Latino entrepreneurs and business owners are accessing the resources that are available to them. Um, at the time, as you can imagine, we, we LEDC was not prepared to um, uh, get involved in the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, but after the, the first preliminary reports and seeing that as we were hearing, uh, none of our clients, at least in round one, had received those, I felt that there was a need uh, to get involved in round two Again, with the support uh, uh, that we received from you and the uh, unrestricted, uh, it, it allowed us to be able to, allow me to be able to make those type of quick decisions and saying, you know, we need to dedicate some time in supporting our folks, even if this is not necessarily an area that we have been doing. Um, and I could tell you that, you know, although 15 may, may seem like a small number, that's 15 Latino businesses that, uh, did not uh, receive funding the first time around, that did receive it the second time around. Um, and, um, and, and um, the amounts were as small as, uh, you know, uh, $9,000 for one of the business 
uh, to about $150,000 for, for one of the larger businesses. And together, uh, the total that they received was uh, about 500,000. Now, this is, a, um, this is a, an initiative that we are definitely being more proactive and involved in this year. And, and, and our goals would be much higher um, in supporting uh, more than 15 businesses uh, this time around with PPP. Um, something else that I'm really proud of is um, at the time, I just felt that it was necessary, but it, uh, this funding also allowed me to be able to dedicate a staff to uh, time to be able to work with the Small Business Administration uh, to do weekly Spanish only webinars. At the time, I didn't think it was uh, any, in, anything that was innovative, but I could tell you that it became really the, one of the only uh, Spanish webinars in the region. And I'm talking not just Minnesota, but in the region. Uh, and at times we would even get folks to call in um, to our webinars that weren't even in Minnesota. Um, and so I just, again, wanna thank you and, and the impact that they, that had. Uh, next slide. We also focused on state funding. And as you can imagine, there was a lot of uh, um, doubt of how much um, uh, direct administrative funding uh, it would come with. Um, at the time, it, it was hard to make decisions based on funding. Um, but again, this type of money uh, that we received to provide technical assistance, the way I viewed this was, okay, let's, let's work with the state. Let's work with what's already available to our uh, Latino entrepreneurs who may not have equitable access to because of language or, or, or technology needs. And so we began to work uh, with the state and all of the uh, programs that were available at the time. We went from providing uh, 26 loans uh, in 2019 to within a period of a few weeks uh, with, through the Small Business Emergency Loan Fund uh, uh, doing 51 loans at 1.3 million. Uh, several months after that, uh, we were also administering the Small Business Relief Grants, um, as you can see the numbers there, as well as the Minnesota Cultural Mall Operator Grants. And so together we were able to support uh, uh, over 350 uh, Latino and, and, and um, other um, small businesses. This was a, a catch, folks. This was a way to not only be able to have access for them to, to those resources, but we continue that relationship. We continue to make sure that they were applying to maybe the county uh, funding or, or, or other municipal funding that they may qualify for. And so the, the uh, ability to receive funding through, through you all allowed us, again, for me to be able to allow more of my team and be able to hire more individuals to focus again on providing that technical support. Uh, next slide. Again, uh, as you can see, there was a lot of damage on Lake Street. We definitely were focusing a lot of our attention on uh, uh, indoor malls like the uh, Plaza Mexico on Lake Street, Mercado Central. Um, there's uh, uh, Plaza uh, del Sol in St. Paul. Uh, as you can as you can imagine the, the need was significant and I just wanted to make sure that that folks who may not traditionally access these type of funds uh, were connecting with our, with our team with our staff uh, next slide again lo other local uh, government funding that was available uh, my 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 direction my focus was what's available out there uh, it's clear to me that the numbers of Latino and other immigrant entrepreneurs are not accessing these funds at, at the rates I think that everybody in this call and even in those municipalities would, would like. And I, again, quickly felt that it was important for us to be involved as we're helping them rebuild, as we're helping them potentially uh, receive a check to, to, to fix a, a door or a window. We're also helping them apply for these uh, resources. Next slide. Again, uh, we're aware uh, that uh, COVID, uh, we're living in a, a time of, uh, of, of uncertainty. We didn't know what was happening, obviously, like everybody in April and May. We, we knew that we needed to physically meet our clients. Uh, we knew that if we felt that everybody was going to be able to access the resources meant to them remotely, uh, that disproportionately the Latino and other immigrant community would, would not be uh, accessing these funds 
uh, at the rates, again, that we wanted to. And, and uh, after discussion with my team, I can assure you that every single person on our team uh, knew of the risk and uh, made sure to, uh, to, to take the precautions needed, but they were all meeting with clients um, as safely as possible. And, and this is just a photo of, you know, uh, us going to Mercado Central or, or Plaza Mexico, uh, uh, again, in St. Paul, um, uh, multiple times trying to meet with folks to make sure that they uh, apply for uh, resources. Uh, next slide. These were other funds. Again, we're not the only one that uh, uh, we're, we're not the only ones that received these funds, but these were other funds that were uh, received uh, um, through our organization. Um, and as you can see, the Twin Cities Rebuild for the Future uh, was the largest uh, that we received. And, and to date, and these are preliminary numbers, I feel comfortable and confident to say at least 160 businesses have received funding and technical assistance. And I estimate that over 200 additional businesses receive some form of technical assistance. Um, it, it, again, it was the, the number of calls that we received prior to COVID-19 and, and the uprising um, we would receive a couple dozen calls a day. Um, uh, there was a point where I believe we received over 800 calls a day. Um, and at that point, I would say we probably received more than that, just that our systems could not uh, e even, even pick up uh, additional calls. Uh, I, I also want to just thank the uh, every, every other collaborative folks that we work with. Uh, you know, we love Lake Street Fund. Uh, I cannot tell you how grateful I am for their fundraising efforts. Um, and their, their team uh, being so great, gracious to work with my team to be able to help over 100 Latino businesses apply and provide documentation needed to receive funding. This is just one example of many that we did in, in other types of funding. Uh, Rebuild and Heal Minnesota is a collaborative uh, along with the other panelists that you will hear from today, Gene, and, and two other organizations, we were able to raise another 500,000 that uh, so far right now we have helped 25 immigrant owned businesses uh, receive anywhere from five to 15,000. And, and there's additional money that we will be able to grant out this year. Um, again, the Minnesota Council Foundation as well provided us funding. But what I would like to say is that the funding that we received through the uh, Greater United uh, Way uh, Minneapolis Foundation in St. Paul was, it was so quick. It was so quick and without strings really attached other than to ensure that this money goes to the people that uh, that uh, need it. Um, and that really, really allowed us to be able to be creative and get funding probably faster than I would say than, 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 than government was able to do. Um, and so I'm again very thankful for, for all of you for, for allowing us to do that. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, some folks receiving funding. Uh, Next slide. This is, this is a, uh, another way, I don't, I don't know if it was intentional or not, or just the, 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 how the impact that we had uh, along with, uh, with the United Way, in particular with the 211 and the housing assistance program. Um, we were also recipients of, of a contract through the state to provide uh, uh, housing assistance to uh, families. Uh, I believe that up to date, uh, up until the end of uh, December, we were able to help 1,500 families with uh, with over 3.4 million dollars. The, the the connection that 2211 and LEDC, the way that it worked, uh, I could tell you that um, uh, we that success that we we had um, has a lot to do with that as well, and so. Uh, just wanted to bring up that uh, other contract that wasn't necessarily the money that we received directly, but because of uh, the ability to be able to contract more, more folks through this fund allowed me to be able to designate other, other staff members to be able to do this type of work. Um, and so I, I feel like this is an example of some, uh, funding going full circle. Um, and then uh, next slide, I think I've gone over, so I'm, uh, I'll end with that. Um, we've, we've gone creative. Um, you know, we have a commercial kitchen and, and we know of a lot of restaurants and folks that their livelihood depends on catering or, or, or food servicing. 
uh, we've opened up our, our kitchen um, and, and subsidized, or if not, uh, provided uh, free rent for, for folks who needed it. And they've come from St. Paul and Minneapolis. But this is, this is another way that we've gotten creative with the funding that we've received from you. Uh, Plaza del Sol that you'll see on the bottom, none of the tenants have, uh, have been asked to leave. In fact, we uh, have helped them stay there all of them, uh, and again, a lot of that has to do with the funding that we have received here. Uh, and so uh, I'll leave it at that. I think I've already gone over my time, but again, I just wanna thank you all for, for the support um, and, and of those individuals who have provided uh, funding as well. Thank you so much, Henry, for all of your work and that of LEDC. Next, I'd like to introduce Jean Gelgaru, President and CEO of African Economic Development Solutions, AEDS. He has over more, excuse me, over 20 years of leadership in operational and entrepreneurial expertise. Originally from Ethiopia, Gene has deep connections to Minnesota's African immigrant communities and a unique cultural competency to work with people from a variety of backgrounds and languages. He has a bachelor's degree from Metro, Metropolitan State University and an MBA in finance and a doctoral candidate in education leadership from St. Mary's University of Minnesota. She also served on a Planning and Human Rights Commission for the City of St. Paul, and he's a Shannon Institute Fellow, the Roy Wilkins Community, excuse me, Roy Wilkins Community Fellow, and a Bush Foundation Leadership Fellow. Jean, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, everyone, uh, my name is Jean Galgalu, uh, President and CEO of African Economic Development Solutions, a nonprofit organization that serves African immigrants in Minnesota. We provide business development uh, training program. It's a 12-week training program to help uh, inspiring and existing businesses to start or expand their business. We uh, provide technical assistance in different areas, like my colleague uh, mentioned. We do uh, lending, financial education, first time home buyer education and counseling, workforce development, and a creative place making program to uh, African immigrant. Uh, thank you so much for the support, uh, St. Paul Foundation, Minneapolis Foundation, and the United Way for stepping in in that critical time. Entrepreneurship is now and has been all been the historic pathway out of poverty for immigrants in America and in Minnesota. The small businesses create two thirds of new jobs nationally from only 44% economic activity in SBA report. African immigrant in Minnesota earned 2.5 billion in wage in 2015 according to data released by Federal Reserve. Despite high labor participation rate and contribution to the economy, significant number of African immigrants continue to live in poverty. The civil unrest created devastating impact on African immigrants and others in both in Minneapolis and in St. Paul. As a result of uh, that uh, civil unrest, uh, the funding that uh, uh, the United Way, St. Paul Foundation and Minneapolis Foundation uh, step in to support through the Rebuild Fund. In response, what we did was we created community advisory council from the community that helped to create the criteria and the criteria of uh, selecting the small businesses and how to distribute that fund as well. So that is a way of empowering the community to make sure that the fund is, is criteria set by the community and also distributed based on the criteria set by the community members. So African immigrant, uh, uh, supporting African immigrant businesses through that targeted uh, uh, approach uh, we provided technical assistance to those businesses who have uh, challenged in during those time to provide the 
required documents. So um, as of today, uh, you know, the, through the funding, we deployed uh, to 30 businesses for the rebuild fund. We uh, also, uh, through other uh, businesses, uh, uh, support through DEED, uh, small business and uh, cultural uh, more. Overall, we provided uh, through our service over uh, 4 million uh, in, in grant and loan. Um, I'm gonna leave you some of the stories that uh, we re received that funding from the uh, Rebuild Fund. This is just some of the few small businesses that are received uh, uh, from this, uh, this uh, funding. Uh, one is the business located in uh, GM Auto, located in South Minneapolis, uh, destroyed his business, was uh, one of the business auto garage. And uh, he uh, owned that garage located in 3548 uh, Nicolet Avenue in Minneapolis. His business was destroyed. And estimated loss of his business was uh, $950,000. Uh, from the rebuild fund, we give him about three, thirty-two million, uh, thirty-two thousand eight hundred eighteen thousand dollar. Now this business owner is rebuilding his business. Eighty percent of his business, the construction is done and uh, is expected to be on business in uh, three uh, months. Uh, another business is uh, David Asafa whose business is located also in South Minneapolis. Um, and uh, his estimated loss was uh, about uh, uh, $900,000. And uh, he, uh, uh, we give him about 40,291. And his uh, business's construction is completed within uh, next two to three months, he's going to be in business. Another business in another business in uh, on Lake Street, fifteen sixteen East Lake Street, also was a recipient of this business. The it's a coffee shop, and this business is in operation um, as a result of the the support. Uh, these are just a few of the stories that I'm sharing with you. One of the striking story that. Uh, it, uh, not only the funding connected to other resources was uh, 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 as a result of meeting with the St. Paul Foundation and Minneapolis and Greater Toon City, they connect to other donor who was interested in to provide a grant to a beauty salon. What happened was the beauty salon was a midway destroyed, uh, uh, her AC was destroyed as a result of civil unrest. And uh, she didn't have AC in middle of uh, heat, and uh, she could not perform or uh, do her job. So that two thousand five hundred dollar, just a small scale, but it's, it was critical for that small business to uh, replace her AC in order to do her uh, beauty salon function. So um, that business owner, what she mentioned was more than gratitude. She was greatly thankful for the support because she could not raise that, that amount of money at that difficult time to uh, replace his AC. Those are just a few of example of the money that raised other, for the rebuild fund. We are really grateful for your support, for the continued support in this work and the devastating impact is still some, as I mentioned earlier, the impact of the, uh, the civil unrest and pandemics continue and uh, your support is really uh, helping small businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jean, for all of your work, as well as all of the work of AEDS. And thank you to all of our partners uh, for sharing uh, their wisdom with us today. 
Before we transition into the uh, final part of, our, of today's event, I'd just like to call back um, our three presenters. Uh, and if you could, uh, although we could certainly sit and chat, I think, for hours easily, <laughs> if not days, um, if you could um, share in one word, uh, reflecting upon what gives you hope um, in all of the learnings, in all of the uh, 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 positions your organizations and communities and businesses uh, uh, to strive towards uh, resiliency in the future. What gives you hope moving forward? If you could share just very briefly, perhaps in, in a sentence or two. Um, and I'll uh, uh, kind of kick it off to Renee to, to leave us off in this part. Well, that go on. Um, what gives me hope is today and and what we're doing here and the partnerships i i just never seen people come together like the day after everything happened at the market um to see people coming with brooms and mops to help clean up to see you guys coming together the way that you did responding so quickly i, I literally cried when i got the call that we got that money because it meant that we could do what we needed to do unencumbered. So I feel hopeful that to RT's point that he put in the chat, that we will all continue to work together and to innovate and to look at things differently and to partner. Because when we do that, we can do great things. Thanks for um, me. Renee, um, uh, I think what gives me hope is actually the, the collaboration that I've seen uh, uh, again, um, I feel like, and I know I've had conversations with Brene and Mike and, and, and Jean at all kinds of hours of, of the day and weekend. And uh, that this collaborative uh, uh, spirit that we all have right now, I think is really what's making us uh, stronger. And, and the other thing that gives me hope is, is that the diff, the, I don't think that the foundation world or donors or government is, is necessarily looking at organizations like LEBC differently. Uh, but I do think that we are getting a different kind of attention. The, my narrative hasn't ever changed, but what gives me hope is that folks are listening to our narrative and, our, our, uh, and the answers to a lot of questions uh, and issues that we've always wanted to uh, address. Uh, we are definitely uh, there. Uh, if I may, uh, what really gave me hope is the generosity of this region. What really showed up was in, in, during pandemic and also during uh, civil arrest. The response of uh, this civil arrest, the funding came and from five dollars to uh, uh, two hundred, a uh, hundred something thousand dollars. Uh, that show us how much our people our region do care for other people. What really uh, uh, gave me hope is when the um, uh, neighborhood uh, came out to uh, block the business out to make sure that a small African immigrant uh, uh, not destroyed. That gave me hope when they sacrificed their life to protect small businesses that uh, in they, she, this artist say, this is our business, this is our, uh, this is our neighborhood. We don't want people to destroy our neighborhood. That give me hope. That really, you know, more, that more than money when someone sacrifices his life and to protect small businesses, that really give me hope more than the financial support. Thank you. And we have just a few more minutes before uh, we wrap up the, the event, uh, but just uh, kind of hanging on by a thread and wondering again, if you guys could just take one more uh, around uh, to answer one burning question. And that is, um, what, was most what was one of the most surprising experiences that your organization had um, since the unrest? Again, if you could just uh, uh, briefly answer. One of the surprising and uh, something that we did really as organization did uh, unique was to create the, the evaluation, the criteria set in by the community, to the community to decide 
on the um, the criteria on the how to select and also how to distribute. That's something that uh, never happened before. And that was a good learning experience for us to make sure that community decide on the impact that impact impact them, uh, the community. We always look at, at NDC, we always look at our entrepreneurs as a North Star. And one of the things that has surprised me is that we got more work to do. We got more work to do to make sure that they're prepared, um, that their paperwork's in order, that their financials are in order, that they have enough insurance, all of those things. And it just, it just brought to light um, what happened that we, we got more work to do. I'm not sure if it was surprising for me, but it was definitely inspiring for me and my team uh, when we would hear from, um, you know, it, Latino and Im other immigrant entrepreneurs and business owners who have struggled so much to have what, what they built for so many years, taken them to build those businesses. And even though they may not have what they had a year ago, uh, most of them have told me that, hey, I came to this country with, with nothing. Um, if I was able to do it then, I definitely could do it and probably can do it better now, um, especially receiving support from LDC and, and vice, you know, and hence your support. So I, I just wanted to say that, but I wanted to add one more thing, and, and I've said this before, but LDC right now isn't necessarily in the business of saving businesses. I think we're in the business of saving our culture because it's important for us to understand that if it took 30 some years for me to be able to get a paleta from the corner of park and lake, uh, and now my daughter uh, is having the same type of paleta, the same type of ice cream that I grew up having, but it took 30 plus years for that to happen here in Minnesota. I can tell you that it's very important for us to continue to invest in these businesses so that our culture, not the Latino culture, but the Minnesotano culture continues and that all of our kids know what a paleta is and it doesn't take 30 plus years for them to have the first paleta made in Minnesota. Well said, that's a beautiful place to end on. I'd like to give a special, again, shout out um, and respect up to our, our partners in this work, the Minneapolis Foundation and the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundations. And of course, thank you to all of our funders who made the Twin Cities the Build for the Future Fund possible and a success. Your belief in our mission is inspiring and we could not do this essential work without you. We hope you've enjoyed celebrating, learning, and discussing uh, uh, your impact in our community. And thank you for joining us. I hope you have a, a lovely evening. Be well and take care. Thank you.